Hello, everyone. We have 22 participants right now. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. It's 3 p.m. So welcome and to our research and winemaking webinar series. Uh, thanks for being with us today. So we hope you will enjoy the webinar today about microoxygenation and oxygen management. And we hope you will develop knowledge and learn skills to be used in your vineyard and winery. So I'm Dr. Aude Watrelo. I'm an assistant professor of Enology and Extension Specialist in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. And I'm co-hosting this webinar with my friend and colleague, Drew Horton, a research specialist of Enology at the University of Minnesota's Grape Breeding and Enology Project. So before we start the webinar, I have just few instru instructions. Uh, so the webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube by the end of the year. I'm sure it will be available sooner, but uh, so if you want, you can take a look at YouTube. You will have the, the access to all the previous uh, recording um, from last year and this year. Uh, also, so during the webinar, feel free to type your questions either in the Q&A box or the chat box that you can find on the three dots at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will answer your question at the end during the round table um, and the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also, at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email to complete the Quartric survey about how we did and how we can improve uh, things for the future webinar. So please take just, I would say, two minutes to complete the survey. Drew, if you want to explain what we are going to do today. I will. Thank you, Ode. Uh, mm -hmm. So today we're going to have two uh, expert presentations, uh, and uh, that will be followed by a, a winemaker panel discussion or a roundtable uh, on the subject of microoxygenation techniques, uh, the pros and cons of microoxygenation, uh, or we call it microox or, 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 or MOX. Uh, and also, we'll, we'll look at oxygen in general, any specific tips and techniques uh, that uh, our winemakers use to manage oxygen uh, and oxidation uh, throughout the winemaking process. Uh, starting today, uh, presenting will be Dr. Angelita Gambuti from the University of Naples, uh, Federico II uh, in Italy. Uh, and that will be uh, followed by Mark Cave. Uh, from the AEB company. Uh, AEB is a company specializing in biotechnology, uh, microoxidation, uh, uh, filtration equipment, uh, various other uh, winemaking uh, uh, apparatuses and techniques. Uh, so then after uh, Mark Cave uh, and during the panel discussion, uh, we're going to be joined by three uh, Midwest winemakers. Uh, that's uh, Ann Zwink from Soldier Creek Winery in Iowa. Uh, Laura Delaney, Ro sorry, Laura Rosler Delaney from El Moro Vineyard in Trempeleau, Wisconsin, uh, and Jessica Youngblood from Youngblood Vineyards uh, in Ray, Michigan. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with our first presenter today, uh, Dr. Angelita Gambuti. Mm -hmm. So, Angelita, you will be able to share your screen while I'm introducing you. So, Angelita Gambuti is an associate professor of wine chemistry and enology at the University of Naples, Federico II. In 1995, she completed her master's degree in chemistry at the University of Naples, Federico II, and she specialized in applied biotechnology in 2000 at the same university. From 1999 to 2001, she was employed at Taburno Winery as responsible of research and development laboratory and in 2001, she became research assistant at the university. Uh, since 2015, she has been an associate professor at the University of Naples, Federico II. Nowadays, she is coordinator of viticulture and enology bachelor degrees of her university and president of the Italian Organization of Viticulture and Enology University courses. During her teaching and research activities, she spent several periods abroad University of California, Davis, um, National University of Cuyo, Mendoza, Argentina, and University of Guru, which is in Uganda. Her research mainly focuses on the characterization of grape and wine polyphenols and study of their evolution over time. She has a particular interest in, and expertise 
with respect to the understanding of factors in processing, aging, and oxygen exposure affecting chromatic cr characteristics and astringency of red wine. She also serves as referee for international journals and she is author and co-author of several papers published in primary referred journals. So Angelita, we are ready. Okay. Whenever yes, you thank you. Thank you, Oda, for introducing me and for this uh, invitation. I'm very glad to be here uh, with you. So nowadays we are uh, speaking about uh, oxidation management and micro uh, oxygenation. So uh, we, we know that uh, oxygen is one of the major rector of wine transformation. And uh, oxygen is a gas, is uh, in the air, uh, but it's not the, the not the only gas that is in contact with wine. We know that also nitrogen, carbon dioxide, uh, are in contact with wine. Uh, but unlike nitrogen uh, and carbon dioxide, oxygen uh, is consumed by wine components. Uh, is consumed in uh, several reactions that are uh, important for wine quality. Some of them are very detrimental for the quality of wine. This is wine, uh, we top wine every, every time in a winery, but also some of them are beneficial. So to better uh, understand how to manage oxygen, to be sure that we have uh, only the positive effect and not, only, and not also the uh, negative one, uh, I have now to give you a uh, few information uh, about the chemistry uh, of oxygen in wine. Uh, oxygen doesn't uh, directly react with wine, but it needs to be um, catalyzed, uh, all the reactions uh, between oxygen and especially uh, phenolic compounds are catalyzed by uh, metal traces, iron uh, or copper. And uh, uh, after this initial reaction, uh, there are all a series, uh, a series of other reactions giving two uh, important products, high reactive in the oxidation process, that are the uh, quinones that you can see here, and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, as you know, is a, a a strong reactant that in wine uh, gives the production of free radicals and the free radicals can react with all compounds that are in wines in wines obviously the most abundant uh, is the ethanol so hydroxy radicals uh, react with the ethanol giving uh, the main uh, product of oxidation that is acetaldehyde so uh, <laughs> How uh, these compounds are responsible for the sensory quality of uh, uh, wine after an, an oxidation? So, uh, briefly, quinones uh, are responsible for positive effect because quinones are responsible of the um, trapping of sulfur compounds. So are quinones that are useful when we have some uh, reductive of flavor. Uh, but also, if uh, quinones in wine uh, are, uh, are too much, we can have some reactions giving uh, a negative aldehyde with um, a smell uh, of uh, boiled potatoes or um, bees, bees wax or honey. Uh, but also, quinones can react with other phenolic compounds in wine, giving some, uh, give some browing. Uh, compounds uh, that we can see, uh, especially in white wines. Instead, uh, in the case of uh, uh, red wine, uh, it's very important the production of acetaldehyde uh, as a, a second important uh, element in the reactions we saw. Acetaldehyde can react with entocyanins and tannins that are in wines. Uh, giving the formation of some stable polymeric pigments that uh, made red wine, uh, that give red wine longevity. Also, acetaldehyde can react with uh, tannins and flavanols, uh, changing the structure of uh, tannins. And uh, very often, um, 
these reactions are useful to decrease the astringency of uh, some red wines. Uh, rarely, it may happen that the, uh, the effect is instead negative. Uh, but when the acetaldehyde is too much, we can have some negative of flavor. Uh, we can have the of flavor of uh, oxidated apple, or also uh, we can have some other uh, oxidative uh, of flavor, such as uh, um, the, those we found in the port wines or in Madeira wines due to sotolon or cyclic acetals. So, this is briefly the chemistry uh, of oxygen uh, in wine, but this is only one of the uh, reactions that, that oxygen can give in wine, because also, I don't know what, oh, wait up now. Okay, because also oxygen um, can affect the um, microorganisms in wines, interact uh, with them. In fact, during alcoholic fermentation, uh, we know that uh, oxygen can increase the synthesis of sterols by yeasts. Uh, so it can help to lower the time of alcoholic fermentation, increase the alcohol tolerance of yeasts, and also, and this is uh, very important, um, it can be useful to decrease the amount of reductive of flavors uh, produced by yeasts. But uh, especially uh, after the fermentation, oxygen can be very detrimental because uh, uh, it can help uh, the survival of uh, acetic acid bacteria and the bretanomyces. And uh, as you know very well, uh, these micro microorganisms are responsible for the uh, phenolic of flavor and also of uh, acidic acid, so volatile acidity. So in this case, uh, oxygen is really, really dangerous for, uh, for the wine. So, uh, but when does oxygen come in contact with the wine? Uh, wine, uh, first of all, we have to understand that uh, uh, the concentration of oxygen in wines um, are different, and uh, especially we have to, to consider the maximum concentra concentration we can have, and this is the uh, saturation com concentration that is uh, almost 8 ppm. It depends on the kind of wine, it depends on the temperature, but usually from 6.5 to 8 ppm. Uh, and then uh, you can see, as you can see in this uh, slide, we have a different amount of oxygen uh, for each phase of winemaking. Uh, during the grape crushing, uh, pumping over, uh, pumping, uh, transfer from tank to tank, filtration, racking, centrifugation, tartaric stabilization. Uh, you can find uh, the range of oxygen that usually, but it depends on how the enologist uh, works, and uh, but usually the amount that in every one of this phase of oxygen that you can transfer to wine are in this in the range that you can read in this slide. Uh, however, in all these initial phases of winemaking, uh, you have the addition of oxygen in, a, in this specific time in which you apply this, uh, uh, this particular step of winemaking. Instead, when you uh, put wine in a barrel or when you put wine in the bottle, uh, oxygen, um, oxygen can, can be in contact with the wine, but uh, the contact is continuous. So in this case, we have a flow of oxygen coming from the air in contact with wine. So in this case, we speak not of not of a, a concentration of oxygen uh, dissolved in wine in a specific phase, but this in this case uh, we speak of oxygen transfer rate, which is uh, the rate of transfer of oxygen in this particular uh, phase of maturation of wine. And during barrel aging, uh, we have a transfer of oxygen. Um, passing through the wood of the barrel, 
um, usually uh, from 9 to 12 uh, ppm per year, but we can have also, uh, obviously, uh, different values depending on the kind of wood, on the humidity of the wood, the thickness, uh, the grain of the staves, and, uh, um, and temperature. Uh, but also, uh, during the bottle aging, we have the transfer of oxygen from uh, the air to the wine. And this is the oxygen passing through the closure. In this case, the amount of oxygen uh, are lower than uh, in the case of uh, barrel aging. And usually we have values be between 0 0.5 to 3 ppm uh, per year. So, but every winemaker uh, knows uh, that some red wines uh, have a, a beneficial effect of barrel aging, because after barrel aging, uh, we have an improvement of the body of the wine. Uh, sometimes the structure is much better, the mouthfeel uh, is better because we have uh, less astringent tannins. Uh, but what, what, uh, what happened in this period that, as I told before, some oxygen is transferred uh, to the wine. So, giving this uh, observation, in the uh, 90s, uh, some technicians and scientists uh, um, decided to point out a system that, that essentially uh, mimicked what usually uh, happens during barrel aging. This is why and how microoxygenation was born. So microoxygenation is a technique developed to introduce oxygen into wine in a controlled manner. In this way, uh, we have we can have the same effect uh, of storage in barrel, uh, but in less time and decreasing all the costs of uh, uh, buying the barrels and uh, what else. Uh, how it can be done? Uh, oxygen is bubbled into the wine, that usually is uh, into a still, stainless steel tank. Um, and obviously, what is important, the rate of addition of oxygen. And uh, uh, an important uh, element is that the rate of addition of oxygen has to be lower than the rate of consumption of oxygen. We saw that uh, oxygen is involved in numerous reactions. If we want to do a microoxygenation, if we want to give oxygen to a wine, we have to be sure that oxygen is consumed uh, by the wine and, uh, and not that if we are too fast, oxygen uh, accumulate into the wine, rise into the, to the tank and reach the um, head space. So this is a negative effect if the rate is too high. So it's fundamental to control the rate of uh, oxygen exposure, but we can also uh, add oxygen to a wine, uh, to a mast. In this case, we call the practice macro oxygenation because in this case uh, we add a concentration higher of oxygen per each day in which we want to do this during the fermentation. And we do this uh, especially uh, to decrease the reductive of flavor linked to um, particular uh, winemaking uh, phases. Uh, how we do this? Usually, uh, it is applied by sparging uh, compressed air into a mast uh, during the fermentation, and the amount of dissolved oxygen are from 4 to 8 ppm per each day of the treatment. Instead, when we consider the bottle aging, uh, in this case, the amount of oxygen, as I told before, are lower than microoxygenation, and we, uh, we speak of nano-oxygenation. So which are the uh, microoxygenation systems that has, are usually used um, in, uh, in a winery? The traditional one uh, was, uh, uh, was done by using a diffuser made uh, of stainless steel or ceramic, 
uh, is a porous uh, diffuser in which uh, uh, there is the production of bubbles, the formation of so bubbles of oxygen that uh, uh, rise during uh, in, into the tank. And so there is the formation of a bubble plume uh, rising into the tank, but it's important that the height of the tank has to be higher than two and uh, an half meters to avoid uh, that oxygen accumulate into the tank. And so the practice is not useful and uh, also dangerous in some cases. Also, it's important uh, to show you another practice, that another system that is used, uh, that is the use of a permeable membrane in which oxygen diffuses through the uh, membrane into the wine. Uh, so the membrane is connected to, to an oxygen supply uh, and uh, a dosing system. In this case, uh, sometimes you have to be sure that there is no count uh, to consider that you consider the um, counter pressure of the wine uh, with respect to the membrane. Uh, membrane. Sometimes, instead, uh, some uh, supplier propose also uh, some plastic tank uh, tanks with specific uh, oxygen permeability. But in this case, it's difficult to uh, control the oxygen supply, also considering the, the oxygen uh, passing uh, through the lid. Um, what else? As you can apply microoxygenation in a winery, uh, usually a winemaker can apply microoxygenation before malolactic fermentation. But in this case, uh, you have to consider that you have a wine that is not stable. Uh, but you can uh, also, in this case, favor uh, malolactic fermentation if uh, is uh, one of the, the things that the winemaker wants. Uh, uh, otherwise, the uh, microoxygenation can be applied post malolactic fermentation. In this case, the condition the conditions uh, are much more controlled. Um, a parameter fundamental uh, for the application of microoxygenation is the temperature, because we are using a gas, and the solubility of gas increase, uh, increases when you have lower temperature. Uh, so if the temperature is too low, below 15 uh, degrees Celsius or 59 degrees, degrees Fahrenheit, um, you can have the accumulation of oxygen in the wine and also the speed of the um, chemical reactions of oxidation are too slow. If instead the temperature is too high, higher than 20 uh, degrees Celsius or 69 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, oxygen uh, has too low uh, solubility, so we don't have the effect we want. Another factor to consider uh, is the turbidity of wine. Uh, to apply microoxygenation, it's important that the turbidity is below uh, 200 and two, uh, the optimal uh, limit is below 100 and two. Uh, so, now we know that uh, we have some few rules uh, to, uh, to consider when we have to apply a microoxygenation. The first thing is to uh, well uh, consider, as well uh, show us the dosage, to, uh, the dosage of the oxygen. The other thing is the height of the tank, the wine temperature, and the size of the oxygen bubbles. Uh, but as when you decide to put a wine in a barrel, it's very important also that you well decide which is the wine that you on which you have to apply microoxygenation, because not all the wine are, are, can be uh, use it for a microoxygenation because sometimes when you apply 
to uh, great amount of oxygen. You can have the appearance of uh, oxidative of flavor, a loss of color, increase uh, an increase of bitterness and dryness of tannins. So it's important that you choose the good wine to apply uh, this um, technique. But I repeat this uh, as when you choose the uh, wine to put in the barrel. Um, but we know that in wine, there are also some antioxidants. And especially we know that uh, usually in wine, uh, there is a sulfur dioxide. So what about sulfur dioxide, but also some other antioxidant as uh, glutathione? And uh, uh, what about the anthocyanin concentration, the phenolic concentration? So now I want to show you uh, some little experiment we did, and not only us, um, trying to give some, some information on this. The first experiment I want to show you is an experiment that I did when I was in uh, Davis uh, in the lab of uh, Professor Weatherhouse. Because uh, giving back to the going back to the um, oxidation cascade, as you can see, sulfur dioxide, but also glutathione, uh, are able uh, to react with the two main players of oxidation, so quinones and hydrogen peroxide. So the question was, but what happened when we have a wine with the sulfur dioxide, and we know that all the while, most all wines have uh, sulfur dioxide. What happened when we practice uh, microoxygenation? So what we did was to evaluate the oxygen we were adding during microoxygenation, the uh, the evolution of sulfur dioxide, and also the amount of acetaldehyde that was formed during the treatment. So uh, we did our experiment considering uh, Cabernet Sauvignon wines. Um, we applied the microoxygenation uh, after malolactic fermentation, and uh, the wine was uh, microfiltered. And then uh, we produced wines with the low and high concentration of sulfur dioxide. Uh, low concentration was 25 ppm, high concentration uh, was 65 ppm. And then we, uh, in one of the wine, um, we added also glutathione. So we had uh, four control wines with the addition only of the antioxidant, the combination of the antioxidants. And then we uh, instead produced the same kind of wines, but uh, applying also microoxygenation for an amount uh, of oxygen of 20 uh, ppm in total. And we uh, applied a flow of 15 milliliter per liter per month uh, at a, a temperature of 18 um, degrees Celsius. So, how we added oxygen thanks to uh, a tubular membrane, but we used also a system in which the lid of the tank, on the lid of the tank, we put also this, a system to evaluate the dissolved oxygen, that is this one, uh, and also a system to do the sampling, this one, that you can see also here, to be sure that we could do uh, uh, our um, measurement without open the tank. So to better understand what was happening in that tank in that moment. When we uh, evaluated the evolution of dissolved oxygen, as you can see in this graph, uh, at the beginning, uh, oxygen started to accumulate in all uh, the wines. But uh, you can see in green uh, that uh, when the uh, when the, the, the at, at, after 18 days the amount of oxygen uh, dramatically fall for the wine in which there was the, the lower concentration of sulfur dioxide and instead also for the other wines just uh, after 21 22 days 
uh, oxygen started to be uh, consumed much more. So contemporary, we saw also that sulfur dioxide was below, as you can see here, below 10 ppm. Contemporary, uh, so at the same time, we saw also that just after the starting of the consumption of the uh, oxygen, there was the production of acetaldehyde. And the amount of acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde produced was higher in the wine where the concentration of sulfur dioxide uh, was lower. So this is an important result because it, um, it shows uh, show that uh, uh, several things happens during microoxygenation. First of all, the, um, all the reactions of oxidation uh, started very fast when the amount of sulfur dioxide is close to zero. And especially just after the amount of sulfur dioxide is close to zero, uh, the production of acetaldehyde um, increased. So it's important, this, um, this information, because uh, uh, if we, as in this case, we stopped uh, microoxygenation after 30 days, uh, you can see that in the wine where there wasn't sulfur dioxide, uh, we have a concentration of acetaldehyde of 40 ppm. So we have to be careful in the uh, further phases of wine making, because when we have free acetaldehyde, we know also that wine can be uh, oxidated if the, the acetaldehyde is not controlled. And especially uh, you, you know that acetaldehyde is the strong binder uh, of sulfur dioxide. So if you add sulfur dioxide, you have to consider this. So what we did was uh, to, uh, to continue the experiment in, uh, in which way? Uh, one month later, we added the sulfur dioxide to wines uh, before bottling. But how we added the sulfur dioxide? We considered the fact that in wines uh, there were different amount of acetaldehyde. So we added the sulfur dioxide until in every bottle the amount of free sulfur dioxide was 25 ppm. We closed the bottle with uh, the bottles with a closure that had a specific permeability uh, to the oxygen. And then we stored our bottles and we analyzed the wines three years later to see which was the effect, the long time effect of microoxygenation and of sulfur dioxide and glutathione, the glutathione that, were, that were in the wines. So, what about the results? This is, uh, uh, these are the results uh, uh, just after the end of microoxygenation. I'm showing you only uh, the most important related to the color intensity and uh, polymeric pigments formation. And as you can see, at the end of microoxygenation, the color intensity was not so different uh, between uh, microoxygenated wines and control wines. Instead, there was a higher uh, formation of polymeric pigments in microoxygenated wine, especially in the ones that um, had the lower amount of sulfur dioxide at the, at the beginning. Instead, after three years, the color intensity of microoxygenated wines was uh, higher than the color intensity of control wines. So there was an effect, a positive effect of microoxygenation also after three years. And it was due to the presence of polymeric pigments that were higher in wines microoxygenated, but also uh, with the lower amount of sulfur dioxide. So in this experiment, we showed that um, when, uh, when we uh, apply a microoxygenation, uh, the effect uh, is still evident after three years of bottle aging. 
but especially, uh, in my opinion, is very important. This experiment um, showed that it is fundamental to uh, add the correct amount of sulfur dioxide, considering the fact that after a microoxygenation, but in my opinion, this is true also of after a barrel aging, uh, you have acetaldehyde, you may have acetaldehyde, free acetaldehyde in uh, a while. So what else? We did also some other experiment uh, to evaluate uh, another important thing, which is the best wine on which we can apply a microoxygenation. Uh, so we did this experiment, the first one we saw, we see here, uh, on a Sangiovese wines uh, that we produced, uh, changing the level of um, pressure at the end of uh, maceration to have wines with different uh, content of anthocyanins. Uh, we did the experiment especially to see if we were, we were able, thanks to microoxygenation, to decrease the reactivity of tannins and so the, astringent, the astringency of tannins. And what we observed that we had a lower content of BSA reactive tannins only when the concentration of anthocyanins in wines um, was higher than 200 ppm, uh, ppm. So this is another important uh, information. We have to consider the initial composition of wine. And also recently, uh, Kilmartin uh, applied microoxygenation on Pinot Noir, looking for a stabilization of color. And um, in this experiment, uh, he added um, uh, oxygen uh, at two doses uh, on two red wines, uh, Pinot, Pinot Noir, uh, with a different initial composition. Also in this case, um, he found that only when the concentration uh, of phenolic compounds, especially anthocyanins, was higher than uh, um, 190, almost 200 ppm, there was a positive effect on color. Otherwise, uh, when the concentration of anthocyanins and the all phenolics were below that concentration, uh, it observed a change, a significant change in uh, molecular structure of tannins, and especially the formation of more bitter and astringent tannins. So, Microoxygenation uh, is true, allows, to obit, allows us to obtain uh, in less time and with more economical advantages the same effect obtained by oxygen during barrel aging. But you need to follow uh, a few other rules. Uh, you need to follow uh, several rules, not so, so much, to be sure that uh, uh, microoxygenation has a success. You have to consider that the amount uh, of uh, anthocyanins and also of tannins in, a, in red wine has to be uh, for the anthocyanins higher than 200 ppm. Uh, for another important thing, if uh, you have the possibility to evaluate it, uh, is also important the ratio uh, tannins and anthocyanins that has to be or should be between one and four. Obviously, in a winery, you can evaluate this uh, also uh, by evaluating the color. Uh, I know that some of you are working with the hybrids, uh, grape varieties, so sometimes uh, uh, there are concentration of tannins uh, very low. Um, so it, it, uh, I think that you should consider the aspect also related, uh, of the ratio tenants uh, and tosinings. Another uh, important thing is that when you apply microoxygenation, you have to consider uh, the amount of sulfur dioxide and uh, also glutathione, but uh, it's important that the sulfur dioxide that you have uh, into the wine, because the higher is the amount of free sulfur dioxide in the wine, the uh, later the, uh, you have the uh, effect of microoxygenation, 
I mean, uh, you have to add much more oxygen or better. If you have wines with a low amount of sulfur dioxide, you have to be very careful because you know uh, that the reactions started uh, very soon. So, in my opinion, it's fundamental that you uh, monitor uh, dissolved oxygen, free SO2, acetaldehyde. You do the sensory evaluation, and uh, I I think that this is important uh, at least at the end of microoxygenation to be sure that uh, in the post microoxygenation phases, and especially uh, if uh, uh, you are planning to bottle these wines, uh, is uh, fundamental that you evaluate the combining power of wine treated with microoxygenation towards sulfur dioxide. If possible, uh, you evaluate also the acetaldehyde. Another uh, important uh, recommendation is that uh, you should use uh, closures uh, with a specific oxygen permeability. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I am here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelita. It was a really complete picture. Uh, oh, and you. I hope we will have a lot of questions. I already have some questions, uh, but we had a comment in the chat box about nice experimental design working with Dr. Waterhouse at UC Davis. He's an amazing chemist. So that's uh, yes, great. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> uh, so now it's the time for you who are listening. Uh, to type your questions if you have any either in the chat box or the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end uh, during the round table and Q&A section. Um, so Drew, you want to? Yeah, but, yeah. But, but before the panel discussion, uh, we're going to continue this uh, discussion a little bit about microoxygenation and oxygen management uh, with Mark Cave. And by way of introduction, uh, Mark's uh, first position was as a cellar master at Jekyll Vineyards in California, where he worked as uh, and he worked as a winemaker at other facilities before uh, becoming a wine production uh, product specialist uh, for Inartis uh, and then for AEB. Uh, in 1995, he did the layout, design, and build of Jekyll's 18,000 square foot production facility. Uh, they added another 18,000 square foot expansion two years later. Uh, the winery, though owned uh, by now by Gallo, uh, is still currently running with that original design with 80% of the original equipment uh, and has been expanded. Gallo's expanded it even more. Uh, in Mark's winemaking career, he made multiple uh, best of show, uh, consumer's choice, uh, gold and silver medals, uh, over 20 vintages of uh, active hands on winemaking. Uh, Mark has expert knowledge uh, on all electrical, hydraulic, processing, control systems, uh, including uh, IT and gas and wastewater and HVAC and refrigeration systems. Uh, he's, a, he's a great guy to know if you're getting ready to, to build or upgrade your winery. Uh, Mark has the distinction as the first winemaker to use oak chips and micro ox systems in Washington State. Uh, he has also worked uh, in sales, uh, both nationally and internationally, uh, as a winemaking expert, specifically in Bulgaria and France, uh, looking at uh, large bulk wine projects. Uh, wine Spectator once wrote a, a full page article uh, about how he uh, confessed uh, to using oak chips uh, back when oak chips were, were somewhat frowned upon. Mark is a high school graduate who has learned as he goes and not afraid to tackle anything. Uh, and mostly self-taught by learning from uh, from others. Uh, prior to winemaking, he was a chef working multiple restaurants throughout California. Uh, in his spare time, he likes woodworking, hiking, kayaking, and riding. I'll only add uh, one other bit of introduction. Uh, it was in 2007 uh, that I was cellar master at a, a larger winery in Santa Barbara County, and we were. Uh, I had an 18,000 gallon tank of Pinot Noir. Uh, and back then, uh, the Pinot Noir from Santa Barbara was really gaining some fame. And uh, Mark came by the winery and spoke with myself and the winemaker, and he sold us uh, the first uh, uh, micro ox system uh, there uh, at that winery. And uh, and so uh, he's got many years in this business, uh, and he's uh, uh, both in sales uh, and in winemaking. 
Uh, without any further ado, Mark, let's hear from you. <laughs> wow, that's uh, quite an introduction there. Um, Can you share your screen, Mark? I'm getting there and I'm sharing. There we go. Good. And from the beginning. In full screen. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, probably going to repeat a lot of uh, what Angelita said. Uh, Microoxygenation has been around a long time. Uh, just some of the bullet points I'm going to go across is some of the history timeline. You can read the rest of the past current practices, theories, charts, costs, and just a little bit about equipment. Um, microx has been around for a long time. You can see all the way back to the Greek times where they had amphora. Uh, they were not absolute, completely closed vessels. They did breathe oxygen through those pores. Um, they carry them around the world, obviously, in the holds of the ships. And even to this day in Croatia, on the bottom right there, you'll see some uh, amphoras that a winery is currently trying to <clears throat> see the effects of um, storing in a um, controlled environment un underwater and clay amphoras. In current practices, uh, top right, there's a winery in Portugal, uh, obviously still using the clay vessels. On the bottom right is probably, whoops, went back there the wrong way. Um, bottom right is, is a current winery using stainless uh, concrete tanks, which are also porous and clay amphoras. And um, I, I'm not quite sure if that guy is cleaning the tank or he's drinking it, but either way, it looks like a lot of fun. Um, Winemaking has been around a long time, uh, but only since 1991 was the first practice of actual uh, study done of microoxygenation. It was done on a Tanat grape, which is extremely tannic. And it was fairly successful. And so since 1991, the practice has evolved. Um, current techniques, um, as everybody knows, you've all done these various ones. The one I call the fire hose technique is where you pump off the bottom up over the top, get in the top wet, trying to keep acetaldehydes from developing, keep the fermentation going, breaking down the berries, trying to break open the anthocyanins for color. Uh, it has kind of evolved more over to the sprinkler technique, two schools of thought on either one of those. Sprinkler technique is more of a, a more gentle uh, approach, uh, still oxygenating the wine. These are both called macro, and of course those help with fermentation. We've all done the splash racking, right? You know, you've got a little bit of a closed wine and you want to open it up a little bit, you splash rack it, try to blow off maybe some of those hydrogen sulfides. Uh, open up the wine, get the fermentation, get a little bit more active by adding oxygen. Again, this is macro. Over the course of the years, people have kind of evolved into uh, adding venturi systems of various sorts on the outlet side of the pump when they're doing pump overs. Um, the top right is one where you put a valve in the top and the air goes in and, and kind of macro regulate that. Or you can use a larger pore size sparger tube on the top right and put it inside of a tube and inject air into it as you're setting through the wine. Again, these are both macro still. The advantages of microoxygenation, obviously, for most sense and purposes, is uh, polymerization of anthocyanins and tannins. That's where you get your color stability. You're going to have elimination of reduced components, leaves, and vegetative aromas. You're going to get rid of, you know, maybe some of those pyrazines, maybe some of those hydrogen sulfides. Um, any off flavors by by blowing it off that way. And of course, the you know, the main thing is to take the, the short chain tannins and tying them into the long chain tannins, which are softer. So you're gonna soften around it, rounding more of the harsh tannins. The um, macro side of things, you're gonna look at, um, come on, we can, there we go. Improvement of fermentation dynamics, that's, that's a given, most people know that. Uh, again, getting rid of those sulfate compounds, prevention and control. You're going to uh, improve it of fruity aromas because you're going to open up the wine as, as you're doing this. This is now getting a little bit toward the micro end of things. And then there's the improvement of color stabilization. And of course, last but not least, is the improvement of tannin polymerizations through microoxygenation. Some of the oxygen uses, is, um, top two are the 20 and 30 percent. You're looking at reduction of aromas and fermentation. Those are probably the main ones. Uh, a little bit of color stability, technical evaluation. Um, for the most part, that's what that is. Um, Angelita went into this a lot more detail than I, I am. Um, the theory of it is when you're oxygenating wines, you're developing ethanol bridges. So those are the aldehydes. Those aldehydes need to be bound up. You bind them up by adding logic tannins like tanny quirk. This replicates what basically happens in an oak barrel. Especially important is you have to throw in some proanthocyanins to bind these aldehydes before they bring the wine into too far the process. 
um, before it starts oxidizing, make it smell too much like pork. So, um, excuse me, <laughs> we've got some stuff going in the background in here in the in winery. Um, grape tannins, frankincense in general, will bind these aldehydes. So you want to make sure you link them and polymerize them into longer chains. The more stable you can get those, the more stable the wine's going to be. And so by microoxygenation, you're going to need to add more structure, the grape tannins, to absorb these aldehydes in, to, to not risk the oxidation of the wine. You add grape tannins like proton rosin, which is a grape skin, or proton pepin, grape seeds. Again, elagic or proanthocyanins are needed during, during that process. As Angelina said, there is a, there's an optimum um, temperature uh, between 59 and 68 degrees. And the reason is, you can see from the chart that at the lower temperature, the reactions are slower, the oxygen builds up in the wine, and then as it warms up, the oxygen will blow off, will blow up, and you'll, you'll taste an oxidized wine. So you don't want to get it too cold of a temperature. Again, on the higher temperature, the reactions are too fast, and so it'll, it'll blow past your, your target goal. So when we add oxygen, we want to measure it by weight, not by volume. Uh, the difference was back in the old days, uh, the first uh, oxygen meters that came out, they were basically pressure gauges uh, where oxygen went through a pressure gauge through a diffuser into the tank, and you went in between 5 and 8 PSI. Well, the problem with that is the gas cylinder pressure changes. You, you start off with 50 square meters of gas in a tank at 200 PSI. Even at 1.5 PSI, you still have 50 square meters of gas in there, but because of the pressure changes, you're not getting an, an even flow into your tank. Atmospheric pressure, you're gonna have a, a, a storm come through, you're, you're gonna go from a high, high pressure system to a low pressure system. You know, it always worked great when we we're doing alcohols, you know, the, the ubiometer, you boil water on, on, on a low pressure day, and you would get, uh, you know, lower, oh, no, on a high pressure day, you get lower alcohols. And of course, you'd always tell TTB that. Well, the same thing holds true with gas. Uh, it, the atmospheric pressure will make that difference. Your tank back pressure, how high the tank is, how much wine's in there is going to make a difference. Uh, your sparger back pressure as, as, as the sparger starts plugging up or uh, the temperature of the tank changes. And again, the temperature at the wine temp. So management tools for oxygenation, one thing you want to do is frequent organoleptic analysis, just like Angelita said. My practice is don't taste every day. Taste every three days. Um, you're not going to see a big change one day, two day, three day. It's going to be every three days you're going to notice a difference. And so you want you don't want to taste it every day. You want to wait, you know, two to three days to taste. It's not going to happen overnight. Most people are afraid that microoxygenation is going to destroy it or it's going to blow way past their parameters. It takes time. It takes time. So just be patient. Of course, you want to do the chemical analysis, the microbiological control for Brett, Pediococcus, Lactobacillus. Uh, watch your pH, free SO2, as Angelina said. Your VAs are very important, volatile acidity. Uh, this is a chance where volatile acidity is going to really take off. Um, and if you can change up, there's a, now a tool you can use called a kytosan, uh, which you, where you can use less SO2, add the, add the kytosan, and that will help keep your volatile acidities down. And of course, every winery should also have a dissolved oxygen meter, a DO meter. You, you know, that's a standard tool you have year round. Um, very important tool to have on hand to be able to measure that dissolved oxygen, make sure you're not going past your, your, your control point. Um, your goals. Here, you want to provide oxygen to the mature wines. You want to manage the evolution of wine with a precise dose. That's the key thing here is that you're measuring in a precise dose. Adapt the dose to the kind of wine you want to produce. You want a big red, soft red, a light red, even a white wine if you want to open it up. And you can tell from the typical doses, these are very small. They're 0.5 milligrams per liter per month. Um, even at the high end at three milligrams per liter per month, that is a very small dosage amount. Um, you can do macro dosing, which is milligrams per liter per day, if you want to open up a wine, say, during fermentation, um, things of that sort. Um, these are some of the sparging tools that have been evolved over the course of the years. Uh, the number one and two discs there are exactly that. They're called discs. You can see in the bottom left picture that that is actually, um, believe it or not, sparging air into a barrel. I had a couple of clients try that a couple of times and liked the results. Uh, the number three at the top of the picture, that's the old style stainless steel housing with the ceramic um, diffusers inside. 
they were nice in that they were heavy. They went down easily through the cap and, and into the tank. The problem one was because they're made out of ceramic, so if you dropped them, they broke. Same thing with number four there. That was the next evolution, uh, the ceramic cartridge uh, the spargers. Number five is now the stainless steel spargers, pretty much standardized. You can see it in the, in the left picture there, the air bubbles blowing off. Um, you actually technically shouldn't be able to see those bubbles, but that, that's a picture taken for uh, publicity purposes, obviously. Six and seven in, in the sparger picture are, are just different permeable membranes, not very well controlled. The bottom one is um, what we call a racking, a racking valve uh, sparger. You can, instead of going through the top of the tank, you can go through a two inch ball valve and insert this basically out into the middle of the tank, the sparging unit, and then you can sparge from your racking valve and that way you can move it from tank to tank to tank. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's easier to move around. And these are the outputs typically in a, in a service board. You can see them on the left, they're ganged up. There's, you can see four of them there. Uh, top right is actually the block. There's a brass block, with all kinds of chambers and, and uh, measurements inside with the circuit board measuring everything. If you're gonna use microoxygenation, use just regular welder's oxygen. Don't get medical grade. And the reason is, is that medical grade oxygen has moisture in it because when they're trying to give it to, to um, the EMTs are giving you oxygen in a hospital or you know, it's some accident or whatever, you need that moisture to keep your throat from drying out. But in our case, we want dry oxygen. You get moisture in any of those little chambers in that brass block, they start corroding and then you fail and you have to replace the box. Um, because you're measuring in milligrams per liter, again, weight per liter, you need to know the exact quantity of gas injected. So you're measuring the pressure of the gas at the input, the temperature of the gas input, the back pressure at the output. Same thing as it's leaving. Every time it's going out, it's measuring that in, in, in thousand times a second, literally. Uh, it's measuring these things and making corrections for it and, and all done through great science of computers. This is kind of a typical setup. Top left is a single output. You can see the white hose. That's the that's the oxygen hose. The black hose is your temperature gauge. The sparger's out on the bottom there. Uh, this is a single output. You can move this around portable throughout the cellar, tank by tank. The top right is a typical five output. They go up to 15 outputs, so you can put 15 tanks on one box and run hosing all over the cellar. Uh, big operations, I put one of these in years ago, uh, 120 tanks. Uh, five output in various places throughout the cellar, run through communications back into the cellar master's office where he ran everything off a computer. It was um, it's pretty pretty cool. Uh, typical costs are about 3,500 for a single output to 32,000 for a 15, and they go up from there. Cost-wise, you can really take a look at what the cost is. If you, you, you want to get something in kind of a mid-range, you still want to keep your private reserve program, your high-end wines, you can still keep those. But if you want to op, augment it with something that's more cost-effective, you can see that oak chips and oak powder added during microoxygenation will definitely cut your costs quite a bit. And you'll get close to the same as a, as a French oak and American oak barrel, barrel aged. Um, you can get pretty darn close, trust me. <laughs> That's about all I have. Um, why make it supposed to be fun? So let's make it fun. And I've been at a long time and I'm still having fun. Even though I'm on the sales side, I get to go visit a lot of wineries, talk to the winemakers and um, share what I know and they share with me what they know. And uh, it's a great business. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark, very much. Um, it was great to see uh, photos of all that equipment. Um, let me just pull up my uh, my uh, my notes. Uh, so uh, now we're ready for the panel discussion. Uh, and as Ode uh, mentioned earlier, we're now going to be joined uh, by our three winemakers: Anne Zwink from Soldier Creek Winery in Iowa, uh, Laura Russler Delaney from El Maro Vineyard in Wisconsin, and Jessica Youngblood from Youngblood Vineyards in Michigan. Uh, and I'll just say we're, we're we're fortunate to have all of you, uh, and uh, and uh, have so many experienced uh, winemakers here to discuss the subject of microoxygenation and uh, overall oxygen management. Uh, Ode, uh, do we have any uh, questions posted? Yes, we do. 
So maybe uh, before answering the question, so that would be to everybody, but if you can introduce yourself before answering the question, that would be great, just to make sure people know uh, who you are and what you're doing. Um, so one of the question is, would there be any benefit to microoxygenation a young white, white wine prior to bottling under screw cap if it's slightly reductive and high in dissolved C oxygen, probably? Uh, most people remember the tank with nitrogen to reduce dissolved oxygen and add copper sulfate to counter the reduction. So there are two different questions, but I would say the first question, and that's one of the questions I have. Um, so first, did you did any of you use microoxygenation in your winery, and did you apply that into a white wine? Anne, you were saying. Oh, Laura, you, sure. Um, sure. Um, I. I have not used micro oxidation in, in oxygenation in my in my um, winemaking, um, but I feel like my mind is a little bit blown here. This is fascinating. Um, I do have the same question though. Um, I'm I guess maybe to build on the same question. Would you fix reduction problems first, and then micro oxidate uh, um, oxygenate to mature, or would you mature first? and then fix reduction by sparging with nitrogen. So that's probably a question for you, Angelita. Yes, um, so in, in my opinion, uh, it's much better to fix uh, the problem of re reductive problems uh, with the macro oxygenation and then uh, sparge with nitrogen before bottling, in my opinion. Uh. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you 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 may have problems later in the bottle. Thank you, Laura. You wanted to mention that you used it, or you want to use it? We I've done a little bit more research in the fact that um, kind of our Chardonnay style whites, when that we've noticed the the extreme amount of petrol showing up. Um, several years after we were comparing in our library on our screw caps and that to reduce that in using using cork going back to cork and some of them to keep it safer and to make it more because it is it's just it's becoming overpowering in a lot of our chardonnay styles and 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 especially the ones that are not oaked right now so that we haven't done we do sparge with nitrogen we do not sparge and I think that that flow rate is that big scary mm -hmm. problem that I'm going. Ooh, that really sounds tempting, but yes, that would be something to take care of. So, Laura, yeah. can you explain a little bit what varieties you you process and yeah, we with our, with our wine or everything? Yeah, from a lot of Elmer Swenson and University of Minnesota uh, hybrids. We do St. Pepin in. In a very Chardonnay style, we do it um, through malolactic fermentation in an oak uh, ferment and oak age it. And then we also do it in a stainless steel version, just to kind of compare and contrast the, the new age to the old age Chardonnay style. And then we are doing uh, Marquette, Verona, Chamberson, all in American and French oak. Thank you. Just oh, Angelita. Do you want to say something? No, yes, yes. That, I think that uh, when you have white wines as a Chardonnay, we have also some uh, white wines in uh, Campania region that are, uh, that they don't benefit of uh, closures with uh, uh, too low uh, oxygen permeability. Very, very often, we, we, we did an experiment and we were really surprised that uh, after six months, uh, we observed a great reduction in some of them. So it depends on the grape variety. And, and I think if Chardonnay is uh, is made uh, in uh, barrels in uh, Bourgogne, it's because uh, I think the oxygen uh, is not an enemy, a complete enemy for Chardonnay grape variety. Thank you. Jessica, have you been using microoxygenation? 
Um, so just a, a little bit um, about my background. This is my fifth harvest. We are 100% a state grown um, winery in Metro Detroit. So we have 25 acres of super cold hardy grapes, three red, three white. Um, we have Frontenac, Marquette, and Petit Pearl for reds. For whites, we have Itasca, Prairie Star, and Frontenac Blanc. Um, all of our whites are um, in uh, all of our all of our stainless steel tanks are uh, variable capacity, so I don't use any nitrogen. Um, everything that we use is CO2, uh, just blanketed CO2 um, as we're racking back and forth. So we're really careful about um, introducing any oxygen. Um, our reds, uh, we use neutral French oak barrels. Um, so those are coming from California. We use the barrel broker. I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. Um, if you're using any of the neutral oak, we do not use any new oak. We'd like to experiment with it at some point, and we just haven't yet. Um, right now, all of our Marquette is always, always aged in neutral French oak. Um, and that's for about six months before we bottle. Um, we're under 3,000 cases, so um, I don't have really any vintages uh, before 2021. We've sold all of it. So I, I don't have a whole lot of experimenting. Basically, I don't know, um, other than some, some bench trials, um, some verticals that we've done with our previous vintages. Again, we're new. We have, we have five vintages under us. Um, Petite Pearl also uh, goes through microoxygenation in French oak, the neutral French oak barrels as well. Um, and Frontenac, we found um, it just tastes better um, in stainless steel. So we did experiment our first, our first year with a little bit of neutral oak and just didn't like the flavors as much. Um, so we've just kept that in stainless steel. And again, all of our, all of our stainless steel are variable capacity. Um, we're pretty basic with our winemaking skills, not a lot of sophisticated equipment here, um, and um, really work hard to mitigate any ox oxidized wines. That's a great transition for the question we have. <laughs> so how frequently would you recommend checking the parameters like dissolved oxygen, free SO2, acetaldehyde, and organoleptic properties? when applying microoxygenation, but even though you're not applying microox, how frequently would you say you check all those parameters? So I keep all of our barrels topped off all the time. We're checking our SO2s about every two weeks um, on, on all of our wines until we bottle for those six months. So it is a pain in the butt. <laughs> it is uh, dealing with gaskets. Um, you know, it is, um, I don't have tasting ports on everything. Um, but some of my, I, I have six of those 4,900 liter uh, variable capacity tanks. I think they go up as high as 10,000 liters. So I think that that's probably what we're going to have to move to this year with the harvest that we had, um, you know, after we pull everything out of barrels. Um, but keeping, keeping barrels topped off is really critical. Like I said, it's a pain when you've got 40 or 50 barrels, um, but it's really critical. And checking those SO2 levels are really, really important and tasting through everything. So that, that's how we do it. Thank you. Do you also try to check the dissolved oxygen? Do you have a meter for that or not really? I do not have a meter for that. Okay, thanks. And would you say how frequently do you check the different parameters? Free SO2, I'm sure you top up everything. Uh, dissolved oxygen, do you measure that? Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Thank you. This is slightly embarrassing. I have a dissolved oxygen meter in my lab and I've literally never used it because I feel so strongly about sparging with nitrogen that I feel confident that my oxygen is low. Um, that's why half, I think that's half of why this um, webinar is blowing my mind a little bit uh, because I've never considered um, uh, using microoxygenation in our Midwest varieties at all. Um, just because, you know, we're, our, our goal at our winery is, um, is uh, high aromatic whites and our reds are such low tannin that I don't feel, I've never considered needing to soften the tannins. <laughs> so, so I will say that I don't, I don't test, I don't test for dissolved oxygen ever, even though I have a DO meter. But I think, and I agree, we have so low tannin and so high anthocyanin concentration in our red grapes 
uh, that's challenging to know exactly how would be the benefits of micro oxygenation. But at the same time, if that's used on white wines, why not using that to manage H2S or just oxidation and using a dissolved oxygen meter can help in managing oxidation. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Very good point. Laura, how do you, how frequently do you evaluate dissolved oxygen if you do, or just SO2, free SO2 amount in your wines? I am in the same boat. I have a DO meter and I've never used it. I, um, we do use the CO2 blanket on things when, whenever we're mixing or anything else. And then we do watch dissolve CO2 a lot and then we sparred with nitrogen and we keep everything very cold. Um, not, I mean, chilled wise, we keep our barrel room at 48 degrees and very high humidity, like 80% humidity. And that has changed our Marquette flavors enormously. So it wasn't a dissolved oxygen thing, but I am, I am in the same boat that, I mean, my background's in biochemistry, so I should be using that meter. <laughs> but we, we watch our sulfites a lot at the beginning. Like we, we test them, you know, after that first dose, after three days, and then after seven, and then when it starts leveling out, we bring it up to a one month. And we're, you know, we're doing those high aromatic whites that we're bottling. You know, we just bottled our first uh, Edelweiss vintage two weeks ago, and we harvested it on the 18th of August. And then we have a Tanat. We actually do a Tanat blend that we bring in from California that is, we, it, it's very tannic, but people find it extremely the other end of the spectrum and very refreshing after having Frontenac and Marquette. Thank you so much. Mark, would you have any recommendation about the frequency of checking the parameters when winemakers apply microoxygenation? So you well, talked about I, I, the sensory that should be checked every three days. Would you have any recommendation of timing uh, for the others? Or like the BA, pH, SO2. That I go with the two-week yep. SO2 program, obviously. That's, that's a pretty good parameter to go with. <clears throat> VAs are kind of be nobody likes running VAs that they, they take time and uh, they're a pain. But I would say at least run those also every two weeks when you run your SO2s, run your VAs, um, and then you can get a better handle on what's happening out in the cellar. Uh, that way, uh, the best, of course, you know, old school here. I've been at this a long time, uh, not that long. I'm not going to age myself that old, but um, definitely didn't have those tools back in the day and you know tasting was the main program you go through in the morning you go through in the afternoon during fermentations um, every day day in and day out until you're done and then you go tasting every two weeks and then once a month um, but that to me if you have any sort of palate that's that's definitely the best way to go about it VAs to me are very important though you got to catch those early if you don't catch them early you're, and you're playing what I call doctor doctor and nobody likes doing that mm -hmm. true I, I agree with that. You, you do need to check your fermentations. Uh, uh, I, I also check them in the morning and in the, the evening. Um, and I like to get the VA checked. Uh, I agree, Mark, it's, it, it's a pain. Uh, and that's why I send them out uh, 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 to Iowa State to get them checked uh, if needed. And, it's, and that's good to have your baseline uh, to know where it started, either during or just after fermentation. Uh, so as it goes through your maturation period, uh, you can easily see if, if, if you're increasing or not. Um, I'm, I'm awful. I also agree with all uh, of our winemakers that every two weeks uh, uh, is very diligent, uh, both to, to check uh, free sulfur uh, and to do your, uh, your organoleptic, your smelling and tasting of the wines uh, and keeping those, keeping those barrels topped up. Um, and Jessica, I'll just remind you that I, I worked at a very small Gallo winery uh, for a few years, and we only had 4,000 barrels uh, for, for, for topping uh, and maintenance. Uh, so uh, I don't have much pity for 40 or 50 barrels. Well, uh, I can imagine your topping system was a lot different than mine, too. <laughs> indeed, indeed. We had a team of people. Uh, and we, were, we were laying out uh, 160 barrels at a time. And uh, uh, 
anyway, uh, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, when we talk about the Youngblood Vineyards uh, winemaking team, uh, Jessica here is about 90% of that. Uh, credit where credit's due. She's one of the hardest working, uh, hands-on uh, winemakers I've ever met. Uh, she also does all of her, uh, those 25 acres of estate grapes. Uh, she and one assistant uh, do all that pruning uh, in a Michigan winter. Um, and, uh, and Jessica doesn't have big, uh, big, big claws at all. Uh, she's a, a diminutive type, uh, but nonetheless, she puts her head down uh, and, and is unafraid to take on uh, the heavy work herself. Uh, I say that about all the winemakers on this panel. Uh, they're some of my favorite wines uh, and, and, and very diligent, hardworking people. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question, which is a good question. Has anyone ever looked at agitation in association with microoxygenation? Any concerns with the non homogeneous oxygen oxygen exposure, depending on oxygen injection or bubbling, probably location. Yes, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes, there are some studies of uh, some researcher on the fact that there is not a not homogeneous diffusion of oxygen. And uh, this is why, uh, at least in our experiment, uh, we use the, um, the possibility, we agitated the wines uh, during the experiment because it's important that you have a diffusion of all the system. So this is why uh, nowadays there are some systems uh, using the porous membrane, the tubular membranes, mm -hmm. to have a much more homogeneous, this, uh, homogeneous diffusion of oxygen. So it's agitation, but to avoid getting oxygen from outside, right? Yeah. Because you want to have a control of the amount of oxygen that is put. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. At what point in red wine fermentation would you stop macro oxygenation? In other words, when is large amounts of oxygen no longer beneficial? What's the limit? of oxygen, when do we consider it's not um, beneficial and so we should stop doing it? Any ideas of numbers, maybe, Mark or Angelita? Uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, it's uh, important that uh, you check color in a, in, a, in a simply way, color intensity and uh, you, because they change uh, almost uh, quickly when you do microoxygenation and when acetaldehyde and the polymerization reactions started. So for me, uh, it's a quick parameters to evaluate. And also, if uh, acetaldehyde started to, I know that acetaldehyde is much more difficult to evaluate, but if it started to become too high, uh, higher than 40 ppm, is much better to stop uh, uh, microoxygenation. And so always the sensory analysis, because I don't think that you can check for volatile uh, compounds such as uh, cyclic acetals, but in uh, our experiments, there was the contemporary increase also of that uh, molecules. So we didn't arrive at that level, but I think that also sensory analysis is very important. Thanks. Typically, I tell winemakers to, as you taste through those every three days, you taste the wine. If you think it's getting close, shut down the microoxygenation because it's going to come. If you think, on, let's say on day three, you taste it, you go, this is where I want it, you shut it down. Well, three days later, even after you shut it down, it's still, there's still oxygen in there that is permeating through, it's doing its thing. So don't wait until you think you have the wine just right. You know, because you can always turn the machine back on, you know, but if you overshoot it, then, you, then you're in a world of hurt. So I tell people just, and, and, and I don't know what the numbers are. It's just, I, I work out the gut feeling, which is probably not a really good thing. Um, scientist, I'm not, but I just go from a gut feeling if I'm tasting it and it's, it's getting close to where I want it, I'll shut it down. Or I'll tell winemakers to shut it down. Don't wait until you hit that point because you'll be sorry three days later or four days later or even a week later. 
Hey, Mark, I have a, a very quick question, and I know this can the answer can depend on the variety of, of red wine. Right. But uh, but using microox and and using oak adjuncts, what do you think is the quickest you could go from grape to bottle? Forty five days, sixty days. Um. Uh, let's see. Using California standard, you harvest September first. Uh, fermentation, get a ten day turn maybe. Uh, get your ML done. That's always the big. That's always the big trick, and I know back east it's even worse. I know in Washington State we never finished MLs until spring because um, we had ice on the inside of the tilts. Um, but let's just say all in all world working great. Um, ML finished, racked off, microox with chips, probably January. So you know three four months. I'd say probably on the on the inside. That's pretty um, quick. That's I, pretty I, cool. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it any any sooner, um, just because you're preliminarizing the 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 the, the tannins, uh, stabilizing your color. Those are two of the just biggest rules in red, as you know. Um, TH, T, TAs, of course, are also in there, but um, I'd say I'd say probably three to four months if you're really really working the horse. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other question for the moment, but please use the chat box or the Q&A box if you have any. Does any one of you panelists have a question? So Mark, you were talking about calling Dr. Doctor when you hit that point, because where, what do you do next if, if you do get to that point? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. If, if you do go past it, if you do blow you know, past it. Yeah. Um, nitrogen, try to blow the oxygen out of there. Probably about the only thing you could do. Um, maybe splash rack, but then you're going to, you're going to, you might wreck some of your esters at that point too. Um, about the only two things you can really do. Uh, so that's why I say just be cautious, be careful, go slow. Over a period of time, you're gonna develop, Just you're just gonna have a third in the back of your head, you're gonna wake up at two o'clock in the morning and go, man, I gotta shut that thing off, you know, go over to the winery or, you know, I used to sleep at the winery, so I, I'd, I'd wake up and do it. But um, it's just, it becomes intuitive after a certain point. It's just that first time out of the gun, uh, just take it slow, be cautious, be careful. You can't really mess it up. I mean, it, it's just you're, you're dealing with milligrams per liter per month. If you go in at a low dose rate of 0.5 to 0.8 milligrams per liter per month, it, it, you'd be hard pressed unless you all of a sudden just decide to take a vacation to Bermuda for two weeks, you know, or something. Um, it, it, it's very, it would be very difficult to do that. It, it'd be more along the terms if you're up there around one to three milligrams per liter per month. Or if you're trying to do a short-term program, the milligrams per liter per day, which some people do, they'll do two, three days of milligrams per liter per day. They'll hold off two weeks. They'll come back with a couple of macro doses, two, three days, back off and come back in that way. Those are the people that kind of develop more of a sixth sense about how it works. Um, but otherwise, if you're going in at that 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8 milligrams per liter per month, that's a very, very, very tiny amount. And so you're gonna see the results before, I mean, I winemakers are winemakers. They're 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 nervous enough as they are, right? You know, I mean, you know, we we all go home, you know, oh geez, did I get that fermentation right? Did I add that right amount of SO2? Did I well I got grapes coming in? Do I have enough crew on staff? Did I sanitize? Oh, did I order that? You know, that type of thing. And, and those are the phone calls I'm getting right now because they're you know, everybody's worn out, they're tired, and they're not thinking right. And so that's kind of it's kind of the fun part of my job is to help out this time of year. Uh, but I do remember those those many 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 harvests of of waking up and just freaking out. But with microoxygenation, you're in the latter part of the year. Uh, typically, most of your wines are already fermented. They're done. They're almost all, all of them dead. So it's it's a pretty quiet time. So you have time to think and analyze and taste. And um, you know, unless 
you're in a big winery and the marketing department wants to take you out for a Christmas run around the United States, that, that that's that's not all that much fun either. Trust me. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. I'll just say I've also woken up at three o'clock in the morning wondering if I remember to shut the the door on the top of the tank or I or God did I really close that sampling valve as I was leaving the winery at ten o'clock at night. I actually had worked at a winery, we had a we had an alarm system and I, I came in working during harvest and the owner came in and said, What were you doing in here at three o'clock in the morning? He he was upset with me. He thought I was, you know, doing something nefarious and I had to explain to him that I couldn't sleep. I was worried about this tank. I, I just wanted to make sure it was it was properly closed. I don't think he believed me, but that was the honest truth. Uh, so, I, and I see some other hands being raised, other uh, sleepless uh, winemakers in the middle of harvest. Uh, I think we all get that time back uh, at, at some point. Oda, are there any other questions at all? Uh, just one last question, but I think it was answered during the presentation, which is associated to the risk and the challenges when you increase the dose rates of oxygen. So, if you speed up the process, how would be the risk? All right. Yes. All right. Well, we've covered that, I think. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. only got a, a few minutes left oh should we should we should we should we call it a, a good webinar or is, is there is any other it was a good webinar <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, a, and an international uh webinar and a, and a multi-state uh webinar and uh exactly uh i i oh this is this is all yeah. I, I always worry about these events are we going to have enough interest uh are we going to are we going to have good information and 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 so far we we keep uh we keep providing all of that and uh, uh, thank all of you, uh, uh, Mark and Angelita. Thank you both for your time, uh, especially you, Angelita. It's it's now what? 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. 1130. 1130 in Italia. Oh, my goodness me. Yes, yes, but it, it, it was a pleasure for me. It's a pleasure for me to share with you all my knowledge and uh, thank you for, uh, for listening to me. I do yeah. have one question. Um, um, since you guys are, are all the experts, what do you see specifically with the Midwest region? What do you see is the biggest mistake that winemakers are making when it comes to why is there oxidation happening? What are people doing wrong? What could we all be doing better? What do you see that's very common? I, I've never seen it in any of your wines, uh, Jess uh, or Laura uh, or Anne, uh, but I've been to over a hundred Midwest wineries in the last 10 years. And the most prevalent problem I see is macro oxidation. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'll get, I'll get calls from a winemaker telling me about their lacrescent. I got a call in August uh, telling me about their, their lacrescent and how it just keeps getting better and better the longer it's in tank. And, and I'll, 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 you know, try to hold my opinion because obviously the, the, that's too long to keep a white wine in tank. Uh, but oxidation uh, in general, uh, uh, especially when I first got out here to the Midwest, uh, was the fault I saw the, the most. And uh, uh, so it's just, uh, there's a mythology among newer winemakers that maturation is always good. And the longer the maturation, the better. And of course, we all know that's not the case. Uh, I've even had people talk to me that said, well, I've kept the wine in barrel for a year. And I will ask them, well, how often are you topping it? And they say, well, what's topping? Uh, so uh, uh, just a basic misinformation uh, uh, has, but it's getting better and better. Uh, I don't see so many of these problems uh, in the last four or five years, but I sure did uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and that's my answer to that. Ode, would yeah. you? Have and I would agree totally with you. The main issue would be oxidation, mainly for red wines. Uh, and so that's probably because the use of SO2 is not well understood for the moment. Uh, and so I think winemakers will tend to add SO2, but without knowing how to add SO2 and the appropriate amount. So the rationale behind the, the use of SO2 is not 
um, understood very well for the moment. Um, yeah, and really mainly on red wines. And that's most probably because we don't have the same chemistry as in a Vitis vinifera red wine. Uh, so we don't have enough tannin. And so how can we bring those to avoid getting too much oxidation? I, I, and I agree with you. And, and I always make the point that we, there's still no winemaker on the planet uh, who's been working with Marquette uh, for tw over 20 years. Uh, because Marquette was only released in 2006. Uh, now, of course, the uh, the folks in the Rhone Valley have been working with Syrah for, for 2,000 years. Uh, of course, uh, uh, some of the varieties in, in Italy, they've been working, uh, they've been working with Sangiovese uh, even longer than that. Uh, so they, they know very well uh, uh, what the wine, how to make the best wine and how to preserve the quality. Uh, so we, we still have a lot to learn and sometimes it's not our fault. It's just that we, these are new grapes. These are new wines uh, uh, that uh, uh, there's hardly a generation of winemakers who's been working with them, but we are learning quickly. Uh, of course, Ode, uh, you and I are fortunate uh, in that we get to do experimental work uh, with these new grapes and, uh, uh, and, and, and those results uh, of our experimental work are, are hopefully forthcoming. Yes. I see it's 4.30. Yeah, I've, it's time. I've got to do, got to do some. I'll, I'll just I'll just chime in one thing here. Sure. Um, back when I was up in Washington State, we were one of twelve wineries at the time, um, and so we were going kind of the same thing as trying to experiment with one how we get the grapes to go to sleep because of the cold winters. Uh, sure, we were using Venice Verdura, but we had to run a lot of um, trials and tribulations on how to make the wine and. We got together as a group, much as you guys are doing back in the Midwest. You know, you get together as a group, you trade ideas, you talk, you share your faults and your and your successes, and mm -hmm. it goes a long way in in developing a baseline. And it takes you know 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I've seen Texas come along, Missouri's come along, uh, Virginia's come along, New York's come along. Uh, it just takes time and effort, and just keep experimenting, keep trying stuff. Don't be afraid to, you know. Maybe do a different kind of crop look, do a different kind of fermentation. You know, just and, and talk to each other. You know, you can share you can you can share your experiences with other people and don't feel like you're at it by yourself. So my two bits. Yeah. Excellent suggestions. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. We it's time to close. Sorry. If you have any further questions, feel free to send an email to one of us. Uh, so thanks everyone for being with us and for your participation. Thank you, all panelists. Uh, and we hope it was helpful for you and that you learn about new techniques that you may probably apply, not this year, but next year or in the future. Um, and so before closing uh, that, um, I want to remind you that you're going to receive an email. You probably already receive it with the link for a survey. Please take two minutes to complete the survey just to bring some feedback to us. And also, uh, the next webinar is going to be about cold stabilization in November. So stay tuned with us. Thank you very much for attending. Have a Bye good day. Thank you so much. Have a good night, Angelita. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.